the crypto hedge funds, there's a lot that always launches at the peak of the cycle. Uh, and then at the bottom of the cycle, you know, a lot of them don't don't work, but the better ones survive and thrive. And we see higher and higher quality people coming out of the traditional hedge fund industry and out of the top investment banks like Goldman Sachs come into the space. Welcome back to Crypto Insights. In this video, you will learn about Raul Pal's view on institutions entering the crypto space. Raul explains why he believes big institutions are coming to crypto. We will bring you the highlights of this interview, so please don't forget to subscribe and liking the video. And I saw Bitcoin and realized, okay, here's something, here's a digital asset that can be thought of like gold, but this blockchain allows us to have the recorded ownership of everything in this distributed manner. And that was very powerful. That started that journey for me as well. So I became an investor. From I wrote the first ever macroeconomic strategy paper on Bitcoin in 2013 uh, and was an investor from then onwards and have been on the, the whole journey. In the end, all markets are the same. They're prices of which you know um, products are offered, whatever you want to invest in, and there are exchanges or brokers that offer them. So at essence, they're the same thing. They just happen to be more volatile than assets that most people are used to investing in because they're earlier stage in their growth cycle. It's kind of like liquid VC. So it has more volatility. Anybody who's invested in a startup and speaks to the founder of a startup, one day they're going bust, the next day they're going to be billionaires, the next day they're going to be bust. And that's how crypto markets are because you're early stage. So it's before you've got the large products, before you've got product market fit, all of that stuff. So it's riskier, but you're more than compensated in the returns over time, or historically have been. And therefore, I've spoken to many institutions about this, and they understand that this plays a role in a portfolio. It's actually a portfolio diversifier over time and can actually dampen risk of the overall portfolio and give further upside. So if you put it into a standard asset allocation model, you tend to find that Bitcoin, ETH, or a selection of these can do extremely well for a portfolio and still dampen volatility. So, yeah, it's a very, it's a, it's a very interesting area. The only difficulty is, obviously, regulatory clarity in the US has been less than in other countries. So that's been difficult, but that doesn't really apply to the institutions as much. Um, the hedge fund industry is still pretty nascent, doesn't have a lot of money in it. So there's, there's less liquidity, I guess, is the other issue. There's not yet the sort of liquidity they're used to from equity markets or commodity markets. It's just it's a smaller market still. It's still you know a trillion dollars. And those are all hundreds of trillions of dollars markets. You know, there are single equities like Apple is worth three times the entire market cap of crypto. And that's just one company. So you're dealing with something that's less liquid, more volatile, has a potential over time to accumulate um, better rewards. But it comes with the risk of, of the kind of volatility we get. We get used to once you've been in the space for a while, you realize that it's pretty normal every three or four years that it all goes down 70%. When you zoom out, you realize it's gone up 500x over that time period as well. So what is driving institutions to look at crypto? I think they understand the issues of the financial system. I think most people understand the, how much debt that there is. You know, the US, the largest economy in the world, the government's over 100% of GDP in debt. The private sector is another 120% of GDP in debt. The financial sector is another 200% of GDP in debt. The world is 400% of global GDP in debt. I mean... These are staggering numbers. The world has never had this much debt. They are also aware that that brings fragilities. We see endless banking crises around the world that roll on and on and on because of this very issue. And then they became very aware of monetary printing and the impact that that has as well. So almost every institution that I speak to, whether that's a a hedge fund or a pension fund or an asset allocator of some sort or a sovereign wealth fund understands this. So the question they then ask themselves is how can we not have an allocation to crypto? So by the time they got to that point, because these are slow moving and they have a lot of work to do internally to get the approvals, what you tend to find is the cycle ends and everyone's like, whoa, you know, they kind of are aware of the volatility. So I don't think it scares them as much, but they just now want the confirmation that the volatility is out of the way and the next phase is coming. So 
that was the big thing that I saw in this cycle versus the previous cycle. The previous cycle, we saw some participants coming on, people like Fidelity. They started to come into the space. Um, some of the bigger hedge funds like Brevin Howard um, had come into the space. Uh, Soros, um, More Capital, these giant hedge funds, they all explored and invested in the space. This time around, the 2021 period, pretty much everybody did the homework. Um, and you'll have seen it at Binance. Everybody's seen it. They've all had a lot of conversations with all of these people. Family offices became much more involved this time around as they understood it. How can they preserve wealth in an environment where the central banks are printing currency? Um, how can they preserve wealth in an environment where, <coughs> um, <coughs> where you don't know if you could hold on to your assets if a banking system goes under? You know, that kind of issue. So we've definitely seen that. We've seen the rise of, on the, on the trading side, we've seen the rise of more traditional hedge funds um, investing in this space. So the large asset gathering hedge funds have all traded in the space. They're still not yet comfortable with the volatility. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Others span off whole hedge fund units like Brevin Howard. So Brevin Howard Digital is a giant in the space now. Um, and I think we'll see more of that. Uh, because the return profile is different and it's harder for the regular investor to get, if not the book is quite small. But we've definitely seen a lot of interest from that. They pulled back a bit because of the bear market, but that's their job. Their job is to allocate assets. That They don't have to be crypto believers all the way through. They need to be gunslingers who look for capital opportunities. But most of those have done the work and will come back into the space. The crypto hedge funds, there's a lot that always launches at the peak of the cycle. Uh, and then at the bottom of the cycle, you know, a lot of them don't don't work, but the better ones survive and thrive. And we see higher and higher quality people coming out of the traditional hedge fund industry and out of the top investment banks like Goldman Sachs come into the space. Then we've got on the banking side of the equation, all of the big banks have large crypto teams, not yet so much for trading, but building blockchain technologies, the securitization of you know putting assets on chain, but also ready to make prices, to market make, to offer products to clients. They're all doing the work as well. So I see all these, well, I know it's very difficult for most people because all they see is price go up, price go down. But I see what's going on behind the curtain and this freight train of everybody moving towards this. Uh, is happening. I think they've done a lot of the preparing. They've got kind of approval to allocate. Uh, many of them put their toe in the water in 2021. There was a lot of institutions that got involved and really they were in the learning stage. And what I've found is a lot of those institutions have now built large teams looking at what they can do about like even tokenizing their, asset, their funds as well. You know, we've seen people like Franklin Templeton building out huge teams to do that. Fidelity have built out huge teams. So there's lots of people doing that the next phase for these guys is okay we understand it how the hell do we implement it and this is where it gets harder because they then have to go and say okay do we need to open a multi-sig wallet do we want to hold it in an exchange do we how do we do this and obviously there's no etf which is one of the things they're waiting for particularly the investment advisors and the smaller pools of capital they don't have a vehicle that's easy for them to pass their traditional risk management systems because they're not used to um, self-custody assets, right? There's not many self-custody assets. Most of them don't self-custody gold, even though they may have gold. They use the ETF um, as the easier way to proxy because they don't want to self-custody. So they're all figuring out what the way to do this is. Many of them did VC. So we saw record amounts of VC, um, what, 65 billion over 2021, 2022. Um, so that was their way of getting started. Now the next phase, I think, is the more liquid markets. So some own Bitcoin directly, for example. Seen that a lot of family offices do, Bitcoin, ETH, and a bunch of others. We're seeing that. Um, I think we'll see the rise of new products, which is stuff like ETFs. I think we'll see a rise of a structured products market. Now there's more of an options market. So we will see these guaranteed products that have been very common in Europe and Asia over a long time. The next phase I think that is very interesting is this time around, they now have an asset that has a yield, which is ETH. Um, and so they can have a yielding asset that also has the risk return profile of, of technology. So it's a very interesting thing for them to do because if you're a pension fund, you actually need a yield to, to pay 
the pension payments. So it becomes very interesting for them to have um, an asset, unlike gold, because gold doesn't have a yield. It has a yield. Most um, tech stocks don't have a yield. So I think there's a phase of people now looking into, okay, how can we hold this asset as well into our portfolio? What does yield in crypto mean for us? Uh, it's likely to mean a higher ability to own assets in the space. So there's a lot going on. Then there's businesses like I've got with, uh, with built with XPAM is to give them other alternatives, which is the hedge fund market. So you're basically a hedge fund. What you're doing is farming out the ability for other people to take the risk for you using their own expertise. So, you know, how to manage the risk, how to um, capture the alpha in the space. So I think we'll see that hedge fund industry grow massively. It's still very few large funds, quite a lot of very small funds. And the whole space is maybe $5 billion, $10 billion versus the traditional hedge fund industry, which is $3 trillion. So I think we'll see a lot of capital flowing into that space as well. I think this next phase, so the next bull market or the next business cycle, we'll see a mass onboarding of institutions. I've seen this space before. Usually it's the family offices the first to take risk. And we've all seen that in the space. Many family offices were the first to invest because they're freer to do what they want with their own capital. Um, as I said, most of the institutions have done work, including the investment banks. And so now they just need price confirmation and then they'll be in. So I, I think we'll see a lot of that. Now, that kind of makes sense because you know the asset class at peak was three trillion in 2021. It's almost impossible for retail investors to continue the pace of adoption. It needs the institutional capital as well, which drives out the ongoing adoption curve. So, you know, my view is still by the end of this cycle, the space is probably 10 trillion plus. And that happens because of the institutions coming to the space, offer more products to their clients. So institutions coming into the space tends to mean that BlackRock offers a product to their network of advisors. So it allows more money to come into the space via different mechanisms, i.e. aggregated mechanisms of funds, as opposed to individual accounts being open on Binance, for example. So it's just different me methodology, but it's, it's just the growth of the capital into the space. Risk on for assets. People want to own technology stocks. Crypto will go up more. So I think they understand that basic premise. And when the cycle slows down, crypto goes down more. That's the volatility cycle. But over time, the returns compound. So I, I think they understand that. Um, and I, as I said, it, I don't think it, it, it concerns them. It's a matter of position sizing for them to make sure it fits within the portfolio. And the structure of markets, I don't think it dramatically changes because the business cycle essentially rules everything. That's the risk taking in the credit cycle and all of those things so it's the same thing is when they get ready to allocate to risk now if you look at surveys right now most institutional investors are still underweight equities even though they went up a lot i mean the nasdaq almost got to all-time highs most of them haven't participated and that's the same with crypto they've still got this nervousness about recession inflation what are we supposed to be doing i don't want to make a mistake but sooner or later, they get comfort and you'll see them going up the risk curve with equities and then eventually they'll follow with the digital asset side of the equ equation. That that's very typical in most markets. You know, you see the same in junk bond markets, emerging markets. And I would put crypto, you know, if you want to think of it simply from a traditional asset manager, it's a high tech emerging market. I mean, that's what it is. They're volatile, um, but they tend to massively outperform when GDP growth is positive um, and they outperform even more when the central bank is printing money. But essentially, <clears throat> it depends where you put it in the portfolio. Most people don't have digital asset as a risk bucket. So they either decide, did they put it as FX? Do they put it as VC? Do they put it as what? You know, So that's one of the, actually the harder thing is how do they fit it into their in external, uh, internal risk system? But what we found that even though it is the most volatile asset in their portfolio. Actually, in a portfolio itself, it dampened the volatility significantly while offering huge excess returns. And we found that somewhere between 5 and 
ten percent you get a lot more risk. Five percent you're really at the efficient market, and it's and it's really adding a lot because don't forget five percent is not a much of an allocation to the S and P. But if if crypto markets repeat the kind of performance, you know they can go up five x even Bitcoin, and so that's a lot of performance for the underlying you know pensioner who's got the policy or whatever. So it fits in very well, and I understood this because I've seen this all before. And that was the I was at Goldman when um, the commodities group built the GSCI, which was a commodities index. No institutional asset managers had commodities in their portfolio, portfolio didn't fit in their risk models. What bucket do we put it in? Do we put it in as a currency? It was the same argument that and the team went around and educated everybody on the benefits of portfolio diversification by adding commodities in. And that product went from zero to hundreds of billions of dollars as the institutions understood how it worked. That's one of the things that I've been very keen on is whether we like it or not, a lot of the traditional asset management firms don't really understand or speak the same language as those of us who are more, <clears throat> who are more native to the digital space. But if the Goldman Sachs asset allocation team sits down with them and shows it to them, and puts it into their models and say, we can custody this or prime broke it, they'll do it. In a digital world where everything gets digitized, blockchain technology is the way that value gets exchanged and stored and transferred in a way that we won't even notice. We don't have to see. We're so, because you know, the UX, we're still so early. Everything's so clunky. It's like dial up modems for the internet still. But really, we won't even notice we're using crypto rails when we make that instant payment to, your, to my grandmother in India. We won't know that we're using crypto rails when we're moving an asset from a game to another, another game. We won't even know when our identity that we log into our websites is actually an on chain identity. We won't even know any of these things. We won't even know when we buy an equity that it's traded on a blockchain that's sitting on top of Ethereum. We won't know that when we use a central bank digital currency to make a payment for a pint of milk that we're playing. That is where this is going. It's the abstraction away of all of the cryptocurrency stuff and really into how do we change how all of the system of value on the internet a key thing for most people to, to get their heads around, which is a much broader topic for another day, is in a digital world, everything goes to zero in value because you can make infinite amounts of it. So that is a problem in a world that's getting more and more digital. How do you store value? How do you make value? And the answer is blockchain solves this. Blockchain allows you to have scarcity in a digital world so you can maintain value. And then when the fact that when you also figure out that everything human society does is a contract, every single thing, me appearing on this today is a contract, you going to work is a contract, you buying something is a contract, everything we do is a contract. All of that can go on chain. 